This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This Week in Parasitism, episode number 92, recorded on July 2nd, 2015. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent. And Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. Two days before the uh, birth anniversary of the United States. That's right. Is that an accurate portrayal of July 4th? Close. Sure. Today, when, when is the Canada Day? Tomorrow or today? Or Yeah, it's around now, too. You guys don't know. Canada you know, we Day. do work with a lot of Canadians here. Canada Day is July 1st. That was yesterday. Okay. Right. You missed it. You it missed was a it. federal statutory holiday um, which united the three colonies, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and the United Province of... <laughs> Prince Edward Island. <laughs> I, they here. actually met, if I remember, they met in Canada. Prince Edward Island. Yeah, Canada. I've been there. Um, it's an interesting place. I love Prince Edward Island. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's My cool. kids are big fans of uh, Anne of Green Gables. So it's not really um, a revolutionary day like ours is, right? No. Uh, July 4th is when the, the Declaration of Independence was that's signed. Right. Yeah, this was a bunch of people got together, drank a lot, and said, you know what? I think we can all work together. A. <laughs> <laughs> which is the, which is so the opposite Charlotte. of what happened here. We we all got together, so we can't work together. Yeah, well, I wouldn't say that Canada is having such a great time in working together because it's split right down the middle of Frank, Francophiles and Anglophiles. Yeah, and all the money is out west. Yeah, it's true. Oil. It's only in one place, actually. Alberta. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. That's it. There's a lot of coal in British Columbia, a lot of coal. So they have a lot of fossil fuels that they sell mm-hmm. to Japan, mostly. I, I used to do a lot of fishing out there, so I got a I got an inside. Did you sell your coal company? I sold my coal company. I gave I divested all of my fossil fuel interests. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew a guy out there who used to repair the teeth on the shovels that lifted lifted nine yards of coal in a single bite. Wow! And put it into a truck that was classified as one of the world's largest trucks. The tires were higher than the ceiling. Yeah, I remember those trucks. Those are Fantastic. cool. And then they put it on trains that were huge, Amazing. long, long yeah, trains. Yeah, and it just an, a never-ending source of... And know. then we'd burn it. And then we'd burn it. <laughs> and then it goes in the it air. It's like a hack, you know? <laughs> right. This whole fossil fuel thing, it seems like a hack. Dixon, maybe we should switch to electrical cars. <laughs> <laughs> well, today's paper... Oh, we paper, have to charge the batteries. Today's paper <laughs> addresses climate change Paper. Issues. What is a Paper. Well, this like is a sheet uh, of paper on my this desk. This is a piece of cellulose nitrous. Are you no, referring to a newspaper? No, I'm referring to an article. Oh, actually. the paper we're doing. The paper we're doing. All right. Before That's we get to that. Yeah, we won't go there first. We have two follow-ups. <clears throat> Good. One is from David who writes, Dear Vincent Dixon and Daniel, I am one of the co-authors from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine of the nice. PLOS Pathogens paper you highlighted on the malaria parasite as part of TWIP 91. On June 20th, thank you for dealing with the paper so well. That's nice. I was wondering what to expect after some of the online interpretations and comments (laughs) that arose from our work. For obvious reasons, it received some media attention. Catherine Lavazac, Institut Cochin Paris, who co-led the study with Gordon Langsley, was understandably keen to take advantage of that possibility. (laughs) Thank you for the British keen, huh? Just a brief comment to say that the use of sildenafil in our study was a proof of concept, as you pointed out. Even though sildenafil has been used in children, a question that arose in TWIP 91, the aim is not to use the drug to control malaria. In fact, sildenafil is quite a poor inhibitor of the malaria parasite phosphodiesterases, mid-micromolar, as you pointed out. My lab is exploring the possibility of identifying a much more potent selective inhibitor of the malaria parasite phosphodiesterases, of which there are four, with no side effects. Phosphodiesterase enzymes are expressed in multiple stages of the complex malaria parasite life cycle. So we hope that developing such an inhibitor as a drug would allow us to both treat disease by targeting the asexually replicating bud stages and also to block transmission by killing the gametocytes. Mm -hmm. So in this case, the issue of altruism will not arise. Ah, that's good. Yeah. Very good. 
Because people are not good at being altruistic. <laughs> <I enjoyed you. laughs> Very true. <laughs> I enjoyed your TWIP podcast. Thank you. Best wishes, Professor David Baker. I think it's great that the, the guys who do the work actually yeah. discover that we talk about it. Vincent, have you ever visited the <laughs> London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine? No, but I have visited the London School of uh, Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Well, you have done that. <laughs> <laughs> Is it too, it's not due to I have it's not, actually. I have not. It's a great place. I had a good friend who worked there for many years, and I visited him multiple times, and he always took me downstairs to their pub. Yeah, yeah, like the Rockefeller pub. I have a pub. pub. Well, so does Rockefeller, right? Yeah. Do you used to go to that one? Absolutely. Did you pay your bill every month? Oh, you betcha. Yeah, no, of course. Of course. Yeah, a lot of laps. Cold Spring Harbor has their own little pub right yeah. there. It's, yeah, it's kind of Here nice. at Columbia, we don't have a pub. We don't have a pub. Dixon, yes. uh, tw Twiv a couple of weeks ago in yes. Glasgow, I had yes. a guest from uh -huh. the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. It's a good place. I think we should start the Manhattan School of Handwashing. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> the Semmelweis School of Handwashing. <laughs> All right. Then a yeah, next uh, right? follow-up is from Jen, who writes, Hi, TWIP team. The over-talking thing is really a New York manner of speaking. <laughs> you are absolutely correct when you say it's due to enthusiasm and is not meant out of rudeness or to interrupt the other person. <laughs> this is something I try to convey <laughs> to my non-New York City friends. They get irritated when I interrupt them, and I get irritated when they stop t talking to wait their turn. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. <laughs> but I think we will still be nice to each other. Oh, yeah. She sent an article at, at PBS called New York Style. Uh, that's interesting. It's not what you say, it's the way that you say it. Uh. <laughs> and it's a sociolinguist who has figured out why non-New Yorkers find Big Apple natives so pushy. Um. High energy, speech style, personalities. Dixon, are you a New Yorker? No. You're not. So no. I don't think we can use uh, accept this uh, excuse. Right? And Daniel is a Coloradan. And are you a New Yorker? I no. you know you, no, you, none of us are New Yorkers, yeah. but you tend to adopt the style of living <clears throat> where you work and we've all worked in New York City for a you long time. You know, I time. actually lived here for many, many years. I did too for a while. So I yeah. can't say that I'm not a New Yorker, but uh, I don't identify with New York as my home. You know what I identify as my home? I don't know. The Your Staten home. Island uh, <laughs> landfill. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, even even though I lived 20 years out west in Colorado, I actually am old enough to have lived the majority of my life in New York. I was born go. in Queens. Look at and, that. Uh, Where in Queens right. again? Um, remember, I was I was so young I didn't remember, but I was born at Mercy <laughs> Hospital, okay. and we lived on Queens Boulevard or thereabouts. Right. Okay. I think we had um, this conversation. Yeah. My right. wife's from Kew Gardens. Yeah. Um, all right, now, um, Dixon, we should still be civil, okay? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> okay. You're waiting for me to <laughs> say something? Yeah. No, I'm, I I'm agree just letting you. it soak in. <laughs> no, but it is, it is true. There is a New Yorker pattern of speaking. And I know when I, when I married my wife, um, she occasionally thought that, you know, maybe the New Yorkers, including myself, had a certain way of speaking. And I, and I would tell her, I said, you know, we just don't want to waste the time prefacing everything we say with, in my opinion, even though we stated you know, as you fact. You know what I've noticed? I don't, I don't think I'm, I have this New York thing, but since I've done been podcasting, I listened for a place where you can interrupt someone. So sometimes people go on. Not so much in this podcast, Dixon, but no, some of my not, others. Of course and not. you listen to their cadence, and you can figure out exactly yeah, no, when to right. jump in. Right. But unfortunately, that has now bled over into my other non-podcast. So <laughs> yesterday, I was at a meeting in Washington, and a guy was talking, and I wanted to say something, and I waited for him to pause a tiny bit, and I jumped in, and then I felt right. badly, because you shouldn't interrupt you know, people. I used to watch talking. the Johnny Carson <laughs> show all the time, and... Uh, Johnny Carson is from the Midwest. I think he's from Nebraska originally. Yeah, that's right. I think uh, you're right. His parents lived out there, and he kept referring to his life in the countryside and not anything. But as his show grew in popularity, and as he adopted more of a New York lifestyle, the interviews that he conducted with all these famous people became more Johnny Carson centric. And eventually, the guests could hardly get in a word without Johnny Carson interrupting and yeah. giving his own anecdotes. And yeah. Charlie Rose. I've noticed, has done the same thing. I think a, a, a good interviewer lets his or her guest no talk. No question. No right? question. And I hear many yeah, who keep right. interrupting. Sure. That's and right. I think this is bad. Yeah, I agree with you. you should, if you're going to interview someone, let them talk. Yeah, exactly. 
So I do a lot of interviewing for the medical school, and that's exactly my approach. You know, Are you I, sure? I ask a leading question, and then I wait. Do you not interrupt them? I try not to. Really? I try not to. No, you're kind. No, no, I want to hear what they have to say. I have to say, though, when I, um, when I was viewing Dixon's interview on the Colbert Report, mm. I really enjoyed all the interruptions that uh, <laughs> Colbert made. <laughs> I did, too, actually, but it I was thought, hard for me not to react to them. Oh, he yeah. Those, you those interruptions yeah. were well done. <laughs> and he told me, he says, I'm going to try to divert you from your appointed round, so to speak. You just stay on track and we'll be fine. <laughs> and, of course, that's exactly what happened. But it was hard to concentrate, basically, with such a famous person sitting opposite me. Yeah. Well, but I think it it's fun. his style. It it's fun. fine. He can do what he wants. He's obviously been successful. But, but he's not going to do that when he has his own talk show on, on late night. That's not going to be him at all. What is he doing? He's going to do the new Tonight Show. Oh, he's taking over for Letterman? Letterman. Yeah, he is. And I, I can tell you it's going to be a totally different style. I think the guests will have uh, plenty of opportunities. Are you going to be his guest on that show? I would love to be his guest on that show. I would, I would, I would love it because uh, when I was his guest on the other show... Uh, the book hadn't even come out about vertical farming, so now the book is out, and it would be a wonderful opportunity to make show more what money. Since it's not about the money, Vincent, uh, it's about Dixon. the idea. Come on, it's about Dixon. the idea. Please admit it. Please <laughs> stop harping <laughs> on money. No, I'm gonna harp as long as I want. All right, <clears throat> we have to uh, now solve Twip Ninety ah, One's yes, case. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And so, Daniel, can you? Give us a brief summary. Oh yes, I, I took I notes to, last I time. I need to actually. summarize. So you took. There's actually notes here on on our thing. But yeah, I took notes I will, for the uh, first time when you were, and I think I'm going to do that. For there are some people who probably would like to look at the notes online and discuss. Actually, them. that would be good. Then people could look. But okay, so let us remind everybody, as we've decided, we will do. We have a 28 year old mixed race uh, gentleman who had just started his internal medicine residency at a hospital in Utah. He presented to the ID clinic. Mm -hmm. He had said that, oh, I, I vomited up um, a worm after drinking alcohol at one of these private clubs in Utah. And then he had actually been there in the, in the examination room, <laughs> and a worm had exited from his behind. Or, so we assume that's where it came from. Right. Is that and, your medical uh, term, behind? <laughs> behind. Bum. <laughs> Booty. Did it come through the flesh of his buttock, Daniel? <laughs> you know, you know, it came out of his uh, valves of Houston? <laughs> no, I have to admit, I was, I was Tuesday speaking to a buddy of mine who's a physician up in Alaska. And uh, we've been out in practice for a few months. And, and he, he said to me, he goes, so what do you call the abdomen when you're talking to your patients? And I was like, I don't know, the belly? Solar plexus. So, uh, yeah, there there is the the technical term, and I and I think, in all honesty, we believe that this worm emerged from the anus, mm -hmm. right? Um, but no, I I use bum, I use behind, um, whatever the patient wants to call it. I, I that's think what I, I would call I, it again. Yeah, it's it's a lot of you're, you're speaking to an audience, you're trying to communicate. So yeah. I will I will modify. Well, when they say asshole, then you have to wonder <laughs> whether they were actually referring to them or to yeah. you. That's a, yes, that's there, a, there are children. That's that a dual to use word. Show. But right. technically, uh, <laughs> technically, uh, Daniel, I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but it actually emerges from the rectum through the anus, right? That is true. That is true. Okay. Right. Making sure I got the anatomy right. Uh, yes. Hey, listen. Yes, it really is traveling. Our the, clinician you on think call of here. yeah, think of the anus as as the doorway, right? And the rectum yeah. is the hall leading up to the doorway, and then okay. out it comes. Okay. Got it. Um, and that's that's what we think happened. The, that this worm, and the great thing about the worm um, being seen here during the exam is that, um, in all honesty, you you do get people that come in and they think they have a worm, and they they, they are certain they have a worm. And, you know, it might be a piece of hair. It might be mucus in the stool. There's a lot of things that people mistake, um, honestly mistake for worms. I mean, people are not necessarily malicious. Some people have maybe a psychiatric component where they're, they're thinking they right. see worms. Right. But in all honesty, um, it's great to actually see that. the worm, yeah. know that this really is a worm. And then, and in this case, it came out and uh, I was actually able to see this worm. This is, you know, a number of years back. But I was actually able to see the worm, and then um, that really helps to come up with the diagnosis. So anyway, so there we go. Everyone has been refreshed. And the first email? Yeah, go ahead, Daniel. Christine writes, 
Good morning, Dixon, Vincent, and Daniel. Thank you again for another enjoyable and interesting TWIP podcast. I believe that our young trainee physician has an <laughs> ascrid infection. Uh -huh. The infection with ascrid lumbricoides may present with the emergence of a 15 to 30 centimeter long whitish round worm from either mouth or anus. anus. Um, it usually resides in the small intestine and mild infections may be asymptomatic or rarely experiencing nausea, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. Treatment is a three-day course of albendazole or mabendazole, repeated after two weeks. Unsurprisingly, the infection has a fecal-oral contamination cycle with <laughs> eggs excreted with feces. Fertile eggs will embryonate in the soil and are infective after 18 days to several weeks, depending on conditions. Larval hatching after ingestion and mucosal invasion, leading to portal circulation and the systemic circulation, and traveling to the lungs where the larvae further mature for 10 to 14 days. Break through the alveoli, climb the bronchial tree to be swallowed in order to locate as adults in the small intestine. The weather this morning in Brisbane is a bleak 11C with a beautiful sunny winter's day of 21C to come. Light breeze, clear skies. Couldn't be better. Brisk. Brisk, not bleak. Brisk. Brisk. Brisk, 11C. <laughs> you, you, you're, well, I, Christine really, really... When I saw the 11C, did I switch to bleak? I guess. <laughs> it was cold. I guess. For okay. them, that's cold. So that's from Christine Brisbane. Christine Australia. sounds like she knows what she's talking about. Did you take the next one, Dixon? I will. April writes, Good morning, gentlemen. I'm a public health microbiologist in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I work in a hospital lab currently on third shift and have been an avid listener for some time now, though this is my first time writing. Ascaris limbricoides is my official guess. What else could be so long besides a tapeworm? And having dissected a gravid ascaris in a parasitology class, I can indeed say they look like earthworms to the untrained eye. I'm taking a real guess here with one of my only resources being the Atlas of Human Parasitology by Lawrence uh, R. Ash and Thomas C. Oriol. By the way, I was good friends with both of those people. And that's a terrific atlas to use, by the way. I think Dixon gave it away, though, when he mentioned the case of the little girl who had visible worms coming out of her nose because one Google image search of the parasite in question brings up that very picture. Hmm. <laughs> Sorry, I gave it away. The weather in Milwaukee is a balmy 69 degrees Fahrenheit with a nice thunderstorm on the horizon. Thank you so much for the wonderful learning opportunity, especially for this nocturnal parasitophile. It's that evening. Is that even a thing? Is that even a thing? Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> We're having trouble today. We'll keep helping Haven't each other. I haven't run across a <laughs> phrase like that yet in our podcast. I don't think that's a real word, but it makes sense, right? It does. What is the third shift, Daniel? Oof. I think he's working late. So you've got your first shift, your second, and then the third shift. Are they going to be the focus? It's like 11 to 7? Um, probably something like that, yeah. yeah. It's often, or 11 to 6. Sometimes they'll shorten the, the third shift a little bit, but often not. Do you ever work third shifts? Oh, we used to. It was, I, <laughs> I trained in the days where it was just one big 36 exactly hour shift. Exactly right. Exactly. I remember when I toured around after training at Bellevue and at certain programs, they showed me this call room with a bed. And uh, I was confused. I was like, well, why would I be in the hospital if I was going to be sleeping? Wouldn't I be busy working, taking care of patients? Hmm. So, right. <laughs> yeah. Next one's from Robin. Earthworms are annelids. Annelids are segmented. <laughs> right. The segmented human helminths are cestodes. Right. Cestodes are flattened with elongated segments. That right. might not have been the case in this instance. Annelid segments are short like a rouleau. And also, like a rouleau, approach a circular cross section. Mm. Nematodes also approach a circular cross section, and hence <laughs> the name roundworms. However, on closer inspection, they show no evidence of segmentation. Right. They can vary in size from microscopic, free living soil dwellers to earthworm size. Most of the larger ones tend to be parasitic, including human roundworms such as Ascaris lumbricoides. Bingo. I guess he's, that's the, his way of telling us. <laughs> right. You know, last time my son found a huge earthworm. Because it had been raining, right? The earthworms come out. And he had it in his palm. He said, Dad, this thing is actually living. It's just a tube. <laughs> so there's an interesting connection here, right? The namer of things, mm. Carolinus Linnaeus, yes. named both the earthworm and Ascaris. Interesting. And what do you think he named the earthworm? Lumbricus terrestris. Really? So what is the 
Ascaris lumbricoides. So yeah. lumbricus and lumbricoides. lumbricoides, they're similar words to indicate that they look similarly, but they obviously are not the same. Anyway, he had this big earthworm, and the uh, it started, you could see it had a mouth that could get larger, and it was start, it was sucking on his skin, trying to find you know somewhere to go. He said, look, it's trying to eat me. I said, well, let's <laughs> put it in the dirt. He's not going to have much luck with it. <laughs> right. All right, Daniel. So this looks like they were actually going after episode 90, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm happy to get the answer. Um, so maybe we'll, we'll skip that one, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Sorry. We'll put it down below Oops. with the others. Yep. That The next one is Varun. So Varun writes... No, you just... I took it out. Things just moved all of a sudden. Yep. My world has shifted. <laughs> um, so is it... Are we... At, are Varun, Varun writes, Varun. greetings. In response to the recent case challenge presented, the description is matching that of Ascaris infection. Given that the patient left with the worm itself in the examination table, there isn't any additional required lab tests. Just check the morphology of worm. An additional simple stool wet mount may be done, but isn't required in this case. Guess, Ascaris lumbricoides infection. Right. Nixon. Elise writes, Dear Twip Trifecta, I hope very much that this finds you all well. It is pretty balmy here in Lower Manhattan, 87 Fahrenheit, 30.5 centigrade, but the skies are clear and the humidity is a reasonable 36%. I do have an attempt at a diagnosis for the young resident in Salt Lake City, but I also have a bunch of questions. In looking around at what sorts of earthworm-shaped parasites could be have found their way into his digestive tract, the most likely culprit seems to be the roundworm Ascaris lumbricoides. Certainly the remarkable photographs one can find online match the description that the patient gave of the worms he saw, and their behavior is also consistent. They emerged alive and motile. People with intestinal ascariasis, as in the case with this patient, don't always have elaborate symptoms beyond a range of abdominal discomforts. He felt well and had no fever, edema, discomfort, or neurologic symptoms beyond the vomiting uh, incident that first introduced the possibility that he might have a parasite, or perhaps it would be better, said that the parasite introduced itself to him. Ascaris lumbricoides is among the most common helminthic human infections and is most prevalent in tropical and subtropical climates, such as the one the patient likes to visit. He's been to India and Southeast Asia. It is transmitted uh, by people ingesting roundworm eggs that can be found in contaminated soil or food. The patient, an adventurous eater, could easily have been exposed on his travels. Roundworm infestations are often asymptomatic since they have a final glaring symptom. No, I'll repeat that. Roundworm infestations are often... No, I said that right. Asymptomatic, asymptomatic until, they, until they have a final glaring symptom. They are typically discovered when they are either in the early stages and the worm larvae are small and migrating through the lungs, causing coughing and wheezing, or in the late phase, six to eight weeks after eggs are ingested, when they can cause abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting, and the dramatic passage of worms from the mouth, nose, or anus. In extreme cases, usually in children, massive infestations can cause intestinal blockages. So, assuming I am right and the patient has a roundworm problem, why did the roundworms emerge both from his mouth and his rectum? Do the large worms move back and forth through the digestive tract, or did one or more end up in the stomach or others in the large intestine? Also, was it a reaction of the worm <laughs> with the beer that made the patient throw up, or was it the presence of the worm itself that did it? Finally, in the examining room, why did the worm crawl out at that time? In the case cases I read, <clears throat> most of the times, Worms make dramatic appearances from orifices or while their human hosts are sedated. As always, thank you so much for your wonderful work. I look forward to hearing TWIP92. Well, to answer the questions, um, I ref should Should we do wait. those? Should we do this? Why don't we wait until we <laughs> read them all, okay, and then okay. we'll go through yeah, we them. All right. I'm trying to remember all the questions. Yeah, well, that's the point, <laughs> trying to remember. <laughs> we just have one more. Okay, great. We just have one. Eric White. So, dear Twipsters, I'm writing with a guest for the case of the week from Twip91. I thoroughly enjoyed your tale of the emergence of the motile flesh-colored worm from your young patient's tail. There's another one, tail. <laughs> I use that. <laughs> Start a list. <laughs> Tail, bum, bummy, buttocks, Ch rear, Challenge our behind. listeners to come up with uh, 
creative uh, descriptions for the uh, exit point. I can point. think of only one common critter that fits the description, Ascaris lumbricoides. Perhaps there are others, but I do not know them, nor are, the, are they common, I suppose. And the treatment would be the same regardless, but no guessing is needed, as the patient was kind enough to supply a fresh sample right at the visit. Mm-hmm. The only mystery is, why are they emerging? I recall Dixon saying in the early Ascaris episode that fever is a common reason that Ascaris will seek to emerge. But why else? Dixon was asking here about fevers, but there were none reported. Daniel seemed to be hinting that stress in the form of sleep deprivation may be the answer. I await eagerly to hear if there's a clear reason for the Ascaris emergence. How many did he have? (laughs) Seattle is currently experiencing its first heat wave of the season. It is currently 27C at 8 p.m. We are under an excessive heat watch wow. with predicted highs of 32 for next week. Phew, very uncommon for Seattle. Agreed. All right. Next, uh, Daniel, what else did you find out? The last time we heard, the <coughs> young man was on the table and a, a worm emerged. Yes. They... Um, <laughs> I again, I'm always really impressed with our listeners, yeah. and uh, this gentleman was kind enough to actually provide a sample <laughs> of the <laughs> the parasite. And uh, I have I have a little picture here, which I'm going to describe. Dixon can look over my shoulder. Now, so, so one of the questions I remember Dixon asking last time, and I, and I saw this coming up, was what color? And uh, right. I'm going to go ahead and say this was identified as an Ascaris worm, Ascaris lumbricoides, which is a nematode. Who identified it and where and when? Well, I think that I mean, it's sort of obvious to the clinician right away. This is one of those mm-hmm. ones that, um, you know, when you walk down the city streets and you see a pigeon, we all know what it is. And, and if you're an ID doc and you've passed your boards, if you can't recognize an Ascaris worm, we, we would worry where you trained. Um, but you know, it's a, there's really not much else that looks like this. So right then, as um, soon as it came out, as soon as it comes out, oh. you look at it and you say, you know what, that is an okay. Ascaris worm. No need to give it to uh, the lab. Right? You know, of course, we send it off because it's you know the modern world, and you know you need somebody to look at it and say yes, okay. it is, and write it on the form and try sure. charge. Sure. What do you what do you guys charge for that? Like a hundred bucks yeah, or something? I, have no idea. I don't charge anything, <laughs> but you know, the lab I'm sure has a fee for this one. <laughs> I guess the, the, the patient could say, please don't send that off and charge me $100. You know what it is. <laughs> I know right. what it is. Right. But um, they, you can tell them apart from earthworms, right, as, as some of sure. our letter writers um, sent in. Um, first, we'll just mention the color difference. These tend to be more of a pale, a whitish. They're not quite as that dark reddish brown, right, than an earthworm. You know, thinking of, I'm like, Dixon's doing his thing. So that would be one thing. But maybe really the more striking is the differences in sort of the cross sections. I mean, a lot of our listeners probably have gone oh, right. fishing. Right. And uh, this is this is not segmented. No. You know, earthworms are annelids. Annelids are segmented. Let's quote Robin here. Um, these are not. This is a long, smooth worm. And... Uh, so this also had motility associated with it, it, it right? It was actually moving, yes. So how did it move? If you can do it with your hands, I can describe this to our listeners. <laughs> Show us. In- I'm gonna, let's let Dixon. <laughs> Dixon, you describe yeah. it. Because nematodes do exhibit motility of a certain kind, which is totally unlike uh, the annelids. The annelids almost look like a slinky. Okay, it starts out as a compression of the segments and then an elongation of certain parts of the segments. You're looking at like a, a flexible snake. Um, no, that's even wrong. That's I take that back. It's not a flexible snake. It's a flexible slinky. It moves by compressing its body, grabbing a hold of the bottom of a substrate with these little setae on the bottoms. They're little hair-like projections that cause it to grip, mm. and it pulls itself forward, and that's how it moves. This worm... Is totally different in mo- in motion. It's serpiginous. It's called serpiginous movement, and it's I'm doing this like now like a serpent, like a serpent exactly. So it's a back and forth movement. And if you look at the arrangement of their muscle systems, now I studied Trichinella for most of my adult life, and I can guarantee you that it exhibits serpiginous motion, and that's a very interesting characteristic of nematodes. Hmm. That's all they can do, basically. Are you beyond your adult life now? <laughs> I am exhibiting serpiginous motion as we speak. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now let, let's let's hit a few other things. So we so we did. And, so, but I wanted and, to talk about the color too because the okay, color. Let's hit the color. Yes. I have a jar of worms outside. I could bring them in here Ascaris. and show them to you. Ascaris is a light pink. It's sal- salmon in color because it has a myoglobin. Salmon. 
It, it looks like a sal. It's a salmon, salmon-like color. Sal- the fish, okay. Yeah, yeah. Like, like salmonella colonies on the culture plates. The same color, and it's due to the myoglobin inside the worm. And the myoglobin is there because the parasite needs to sequester oxygen mm-hmm. and keep it out of harm's way, because it has mostly an anaerobic metabolism. It's an interesting concept about this worm. Now the other, and this was, um, you know. The fact that people said you don't need to do any other tests. Now, you, you could have gone ahead and um, if he had not been kind enough to provide the adult worm, you, this is something you can diagnose with o- the ova parasite where you're looking for you the could. ova in the stool. And uh, because the females, what are they? They put out a few eggs a day, somewhere about 200,000. 200,000, <laughs> exactly right. So you're going to see these eggs. They are fecund. And they are, they are characteristic eggs. That's right. They have this sort of ruffled, they say mammillated border, but sort of a ruffled border. They're, they're a mm. pretty striking, um, typical And egg. a hearty egg, is that? As yes. As well? well, it's very hearty um, with regard to to moisture content that's right. um it really withstands desiccation well they are somewhat sensitive to temperature right and so that's that would be critical and i think one of our um writers talked about the fact that when you drop out these eggs they require probably a couple weeks and it they all do. depends on temperature and humidity right. that that's time right. period right. Um, but they're not immediately infective no, they have to undergo this embryonation in the tropics though they can last for months to almost a year in the soil after they embryonate mm. so they're really good at hunkering down and waiting yeah as well, long yeah, as the temperature yeah. and the tropics is perfect temperature wise they can be there for and really while they're time. waiting in the soil are they eating anything nothing no really? they're just in dormant stage they're and in a dormant stage like a spore like a dower larva a dower. for uh cenoiditis it's and basically the same but they, kind of do they absorb water from the environment they don't need to because their no. shell is totally impervious wow totally Jeez, okay. impervious yeah. in fact to get them to hatch is a real mm-hmm. Heroic uh, effort on our part. Right, you need bile up. to dissolve away a lipid layer right. first before they can actually... So how many worms did this fellow have? That's a great question. Yeah, that was... And, and I think people asked, um, and maybe this will get it, well, why are these worms coming out of this gentleman? Yeah. You know, which I think ties into how many... Because some people can have just really massive infestations yeah. to the point where you know their, their stomach is completely full of worms. Um, most... Stomach completely full of worms? Excuse me. <laughs> the, the, Dixon Dixon wants me to say small intestine, but no, I I've actually. Love you to say small I would, intestine. <laughs> so even though the even though the small intestine is where there they, there could be so many, and that I think that's where I'm so many that not only did they fill the small intestine, but then they will actually expand into the other areas because there's just too many in yeah, the well, small they go, intestine. They usually go down. They will go down, and uh, often they'll actually sort of form a clog or a plug at the ileocecal uh, yeah, yeah, valve. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that would be that by ileocecal, what are we talking about? That's the junction between the small and the large intestine. They could form blockages there. If Vincent would be um, kind enough to get another New need? York interruption. Yes. yes. If yes. you could get my textbook, I can show you a remarkable two pictures worth that Peter Hotez collected in his travels. So everyone, oh, all the listeners, open up your copy of Parasitic Diseases by right. Dixon. <laughs> <laughs> On page. <laughs> and as Dixon looks for this, I'll, I'll say a few things I was going to say. Um, now, the heavy infestations are usually going to be in people living in um, areas where Ascaris is endemic. And, and where is that? People estimate over a billion humans on this planet are actually infected with ascaris so much of the world um, will have um, ascaris endemic there your expats or your travelers will usually have a smaller worm board burden so i i would say in general you wouldn't suspect this person to have a lot of worms but the extensive travel and i think to remind people he had taken off a year in medical school spent a whole year living overseas in these areas um, and then again, had finished his fourth year of medical school and gone back again for the summer. So he had um, he had spent a lot of time in these um, in these areas. So he may actually have a higher worm burden than we would normally suspect in a um, in a traveler. And an in, uh, inexperienced clinician might say, "Well, thank God they all migrated out. You're cured." Mm-hmm. Whereas they might have hundreds more waiting to to exit, and that creates problems for him. Tell us what you just showed us, Dixon. Yeah, it's the uh, page 119 and 118. First of all, the picture of this little girl with her distended, in this case, belly, you could say. Because <laughs> <laughs> yes. there's hard to distinguish any part of that. And then they actually treated this little girl with mebendazole, and out came 
a plethora of Huge. adult. Oh my gosh. Hundreds of adult Poor worms. Girl. Hundreds of adult she, worms. And the, the tragedy of this is that she might be cured, but three months later she'll be reinfected really? because she lives in an endemic area. Mm-hmm. And there's a there's a huge toll to uh, take on the nutrition of this poor little girl by these worms just simply sequestering the protein and inhibiting her do- ability to digest yeah. proteins with their own anti-protein proteinase um, secretions. So Ascaris is a devastating infection. Dixon, are these human-specific worms? They are. Mm-hmm. Thank goodness. But there is a look-alike worm called uh, Ascaris suis, which mm-hmm. lives in pigs, which can occasionally infect people. So this is eradicable. It's You could do it, but remember the eggs last in the soil for months at a time. How would you approach that problem? Uh, just scorch the earth. <laughs> <laughs> that, that works for me. <laughs> so yes, what's, just remember you, uh, the... What we did to, or what the Romans did to Carthage, right? We'll just salt the soil, get rid of all this. Sherman I don't know if Georgia. salt would. I don't know if salt would do it. You'd have to scorch it. You have to make it yeah, hot. That's right. Um, so, what were the what were the other things? So, why did they come out? And it's sort of tied right. in. Did they come out because oh, there's just so many, and they came out because they wanted to. <laughs> um, we do know that when people um, become ill, like rats leaving a ship, um, the Ascaris worms can leave. Hmm. And you know, at the time when true. at the time when this gentleman presented, I just thought it was really cool. Um, and so it's really in retrospect, looking back, why did they come out? You know, he as as mentioned, he didn't report that he'd been sick. He didn't report a fever. So the the way I put it together is the incredible stress. I mean, as we brought up earlier, is this was the days of 120 hour weeks, um, mm-hmm. where you know when I when I was training and I trained at Utah, and this gentleman was under the same training program. It was. Um, you would work in the intensive care unit, you'd be on 36 hours on, 12 off, 36 on. So for six months of the year, you would only get every other night off, and you'd be working. You wouldn't be taking a nap. You'd be taking care of really sick um, patients the whole wow. time. And I, that that's what I would attribute. But that was the only sort of major stress. Yeah. And I think the worms yeah. may have said, you know what? This is not a good place to be. This this guy is uh, seemingly dying. <laughs> so so maybe the old style residency was mm-hmm. similar to death or having cancer <laughs> or being sick with malaria or something. But yeah. um, no, so I, I that's what I attribute them leaving yeah. to. So in the old days, they used to treat hookworm infections with a drug called tetrachloroethylene. And it was a very effective drug. Tetrachloroethylene was an amazing drug. It got rid of the hookworm adults just like that. But because this is part of the unholy trinity, remember Escherichia, mm-hmm. hookworm, and Trichuris, when they treated people with hookworm and Ascaris, but they treated the hookworm first, it irritated the hell out of the Ascaris. And they started to migrate. But mm. they didn't just migrate up or out. They migrated sideways mm. into the abdominal cavity through the peritoneum. They plugged up the, the um, common bile duct and caused massive liver disease. They plugged up the ampulla ovata and screwed up your pancreas. These are horrible situations that are, that are triggered by these... Uh, these 300, 800-pound gorilla annoyances, mm. because once you irritate that gorilla, you, you can't control it. So this guy was in real danger, if he had other worms, for my aberrant migration yeah. routes, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we should. So let's let's talk a little bit about the, the life cycle slash clinical presentations. They, they tie in together. And then how do you really want to treat? Are you done? Like as some people said, oh, you're all done. You know what he has, and you move forward. I'm going to suggest you're not all done, um, and you need to think about some other things. So, so first is the the timing of when did this gentleman acquire mm-hmm. this? And he's got adult ascaris worms. Now, do you eat the eggs, and then you know a few days later you've got adults? Well, not really. Mm-hmm. And I've 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 heard um, of the ascaris described as the the teenager, and uh, <laughs> I sort I sort of like that analogy. So so why did they say that? So wh- a person ingests the eggs. And now these are embryonated, embryonated eggs. They've been in the soil for at least a couple weeks. Um, but now they've embryonated, they're infectious, they end up in your in in your stomach and now small intestine, right? So I've said small intestine, Dixon's happy. Very happy. And then, you know, a, a few environmental triggers and bio might be part of this. Um, yes. You actually, yeah. the, the eggs hatch. Correct. And now you have these, these larvae. We're going to go through you know, second stage, third stage. There's going to be multiple molts as this thing travels around. But now it's going to leave. So here it is in the small intestine. Mm -hmm. And as we mentioned before, that's where the adults are. But it's going to leave. It's not going to just stay there. It's going to go out in the world for a while. And the world for it is our interior. It's going to go through the wall 
of the intestine, it's going to actually end up usually in the venous circulation, which is going to bring it to the liver. It's going to go through the liver. It's eventually going to end up in the lungs. This is taking a period of days. And then the lungs, it's going to then get into the alveoli, right, into the air sacs. Mm -hmm. It's going to come up the bronchioles. I think we had a writer go through this. We did. Catherine um, gave her Catherine gave a nice. Then you're going to cough this thing up. And then it's back in the stomach, mm. back into the small intestine, right where it started. What right. was that all about? Right, right. Um, Mom, I'm home. <laughs> but there is a clinical manifestation that can happen during this phase, something called Loeffler syndrome. And this is Very good. the returning traveler comes in. He's been back in the country, let's say, a couple weeks. Yeah. And he has eosinophilia, right? right. He's got those, those red cells, those parasitic um, white cells, the red white cells, I guess we'll call them. Um, <laughs> He's coughing, he has trouble breathing, he's got a little bit of a fever, and you're the astute clinician. You say, you know, I listen to TWIP, I know what it is. This is that migratory <laughs> stage of, of Ascaris lumbricoides. I'm gonna send off a stool for an OMP because I'm really sharp. And it comes back negative, and you're like, but I listen to TWIP, right, 200,000 right, eggs a right, day, right, what's right. wrong, what's going uh, on? Uh, now, the, during this stage, you don't have the adults. They're oh. not fertile. They're not oh. producing eggs yet. So this is a, that's sort of a tough clinical. Mm -hmm. This gentleman is way past that. I don't even know if he had that or even if he did, if he mm -hmm. wrote it off to, yeah. like, I felt crummy at some point. Um, it's really unclear to me what percent of people actually get Loeffler syndrome. So the, the other name for it is verminous pneumonia. <laughs> that's, a, that's an older like term, that. but like verminous that. pneumonia, that's exactly how it was described in the old days. Now that predates me, as we mentioned in previous SWIP. I'm, yeah, a, young, too, I'm a young guy. I'm a young the guy. The Kawino <laughs> brothers in Japan actually described this when they self-infected and recorded the symptoms. So, so this was back in the 1800s. So there's that, so there's that migration stage, and... Um, there can be this this inflammation, these pulmonary symptoms. People can actually be reasonably sick, but then we end up with the adult worms, which is what right. this gentleman has. And there's a couple. There, there's a number of problems, more than a couple. There's a number of problems that the adults can cause people. Um, one is just the incredible worm burden, um, and that can cause nutritional deficiencies. Mm -hmm. And the peak ascaris infestations are in kids five to eight years old in these endemic regions. They end up being malnourished during those critical developmental years. And that could be a, that could be a problem that just endures for lifelong. Um, they also can develop obstructions, right? These worms can block things. Mm -hmm. And um, as we mentioned, they're like these little snakes. And what do snakes like to do? They like to find holes and go into them. And that hole might be the, the entrance to the biliary tree. They can cause a biliary obstruction. Um, you can get a bunch blocking from the small intestine passage into the large intestine. Um, not only can you get all these blockages, but unfortunately, sometimes under environmental stresses, they can decide it's time to cut and run, and they can actually penetrate right. the small intestines. Right. And then you can end up with you, bacteria coming with them. You can end mm. up with a lot of... Wow. Um, so one of the cases that I've seen here as a technician and then later on heard about again and again was that with this kind of a bolus of infection, where it actually blocks the small intestine you can get stasis of the small intestine where it actually mm. stops moving. And then what happens? It drops into an anaerobic mode, and then now we're back to TWIB because you've got C. difficile to worry about. Mm. And if you get C. Wow. difficile on top of this that eats its way right through the lining of the small intestine, it can release all these worms into the... You can die of toxic shock syndrome, mm -hmm. which occasionally happens in wow. little kids. So horrible sequelae. Horrible yeah, so, sequelae. So depending upon the stage, the clinical manifestation, you might treat this a little bit differently. So now we're just focusing on the ascaris infection. Right. Um, and this gentleman, um, you might just treat with mebendazole or albendazole. And that's actually what he underwent. He The single dose of the drug, it's gonna um, kill, I'll say the majority of the adults, we're all good. Um, sometimes people will treat a couple weeks later. In most cases, we really don't in the traveler. The traveler, we treat once. Right. We say, you know, right. by the way, next time you're over there, this is how you got it. So just think about, you know, precautions to um, prevent infection. But let's say, this is going to be great. This is why we need the, the old guy here, <laughs> Dixon, is yeah. we've, we're, we're in, in an endemic area. We've got a young kid, and they actually have small bowel obstruction. And in some areas of the world, the number one cause of small bowel obstruction, this is obstruction of your small ascaris. intestines, is ascaris. Right. And in that case, if you just kill the worms, 
you might be left with a plug there. Yeah. So you're gonna use you're gonna use an older drug that you, you can't even get in this country unless you, you go to extreme efforts because it has a neurotoxicity in humans. But it also has a neurotoxicity in the asteroid. It paralyzes the worms. Right. And when they're paralyzed, they can't um, basically um, deny the peristaltic movement mm. that is pushing them out the anus mm. right, right, and these right. paralyzed worms will will be pushed out through the peristaltic and do, do you remember the name of that piperazine yes and Tip so you'll piperazine actually piperazine citrate and in fact wow. it's a very tasty little number <laughs> and in fact if families in the um rural south used to have bottles of it on their shelves because we had a a very serious endemic problem with Ascaris for many, many years in, uh, let's say, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Arkansas, some parts of Florida, Georgia, in those areas where you had uh, sandy, loamy soils and lack of sanitation, you had a lot of Ascaris infection throughout there. And so they used to keep bottles of piperazine mm. citrate on, on the shelves. And I hate to say this, but it tasted like soda pop. They made it palatable for the children. As a result... The kids would drink it all, and there would be none left for the times when they really needed it, and it created some problems. So they tried to dumb down the taste to make it not quite as palatable as it was when they first put it out. It was some interesting problems before the advent of metbendazole and uh, albendazole. Yeah, and it, it, it is a liquid. It is useful yeah. in certain cer certain circumstances. In this country, we usually don't see that degree of worm burden. And with the neurotoxicity, right. we would switch to, we would use albendazole, mebendazole. Yeah. You can use ivermectin um, just as another option. So these will paralyze uh, the worm? No, no. So the, the piperacil and will. citrate will paralyze the worm. Piperacin. Piperzin <coughs> will paralyze the worm and it will be passed out. And, yep, th and that right. was sort of the great thing, I think, in your picture the, is probably how that girl was treated, right? right. Yes, they probably the, paralyzed the worm, hundreds of worms but come you're out. you're saying if you have already have a plug, then albendazole is not going to get rid of it. Well, because then they'll just die, die in there. this plug. So how would you know? So the, it's going to be the it's going to be the presentation, and and we'll do a sort of clinical vignette. How do you tell the distinction? Our traveler, who comes back, he you know doesn't feel great, but he's passing the worms, passing mm -hmm. flatulence, and when someone comes with a small bowel obstruction, um, often their the belly, their abdomen will be distended. Mm -hmm. You'll hear what we describe as hyperactive bowel sounds. You hear a lot of bowel sounds. Normally, you listen to someone's belly, and, and our listeners can do this if they have someone <laughs> willing to allow them. You know, put your ear on someone's belly, and every two to three seconds, you hear a little bit of a noise going Gurg on there. A gurgle. Like a gurgle. Or... Now, someone who has a bowel obstruction, you hear that it's constant. You just keep right. hearing the bowel sounds. That's right. Um, if you were to do an x-ray of the abdomen, you would see all these dilated loops of small bowel because they're starting to fill up with oh, air and fluid oh, and, yeah. well, worms um, also. Hmm. Um, they're not passing gas. They're not passing flatulence. Um, the belly, if you tap on it, it's like tapping on a drum. It's hyper-resonant, hmm. hyper-tympanic. Okay. Um, so there's a whole clinical presentation. Um, one that, fortunately, we don't see that much in this country because of a low worm burden in the people. Right, so he did not have that? No, no. Now, when you treated him with mebendazole, did he pass any more worms? No, and that's the difference and maybe why people, it was it was fun, you know, in a sense, to, to paralyze the worms and they came out and you could collect them and <laughs> see them and take photos and <laughs> put them in your textbook. But no, nowadays it kills the worm and just feces comes out. And, oh, and you don't see it? Yeah, okay. you don't really get to see the worms. So in, in the old days also, just to harken back to the days of yesteryear, uh, <laughs> one of the uh, issues of, of, of small intestinal um, stasis, uh, they would give them barium swallows to see if they could find the obstruction, right? So I, I remember this x-ray that Dr. Harold Brown showed of a cleared intestinal tract when the barium was finished. The ascaris adults ingested a little bit of the barium, mm. so you got a you got a, sh a, a a picture of their intestinal tract instead of the adult <laughs> person's yeah. intestinal. So you got the worm's intestinal tract, yeah. and it was quite it was quite an amazing picture. But actually, they're here on on Google Images. You can find yeah, them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, but you're right. Today's uh, medicine. Uh, so the little girl in your book, they gave her mebendazole, and I she passed the worms, right? Yeah, she did. No, pass she those she worms. probably used the. They probably treated her with the paralytic. I would say if you're going to get that many worms to yeah, see, did said, they? Did your textbook it actually says mebendazole? Yeah. Do you do you believe it, Dixon? I do. That's Peter Hotez. He's the <laughs> co-author on our book for God's sake. I don't believe that. I won't believe anything. <laughs> 
They have the Actually, same girl on Medsc- <coughs> on Medscape. They have the same picture. Yeah, well, Peter gives a lot of talks. And oh, I'm it sure. must be his. They have other kids too with distended bellies. But of course, man. So I think Mabendazole. Its its mode of action is to depolymerize microtubules. So I'm not sure if the worm dies right away from that, or if yeah. it, or if she had so many that they're able to collect them. Dies a slow, them. painful but. death, which we hope it does. No, no, he said after treatment with mavendazole. So the worms look flaccid; they look inactive, and so I believe they're paralyzed because they can't um, mm-hmm. accomplish their molecular motors, uh, which are microtubule dependent. I think ivermectin, which is a neuro. Uh, transmitter uh, inhibitor would also paralyze the worms and they may come out paralyzed. And actually that's good that you bring up ivermectin because that, that, that's the other thing you might want to think about in this traveler. If the traveler mm. has ascaris, he's been to all these places, you know, there could be other there things. Could be, there could be other things. So that's, you know, for instance. And that would be the one that I would, I would worry right, about long, right, you know, in, right, the, in right. the future, let's say this person, you know, does a fellowship and is again immunosuppressed. <laughs> exactly. You know, is the strong, yeah, I don't think that's enough to... Uh, so so what, <laughs> a, what advice would you give him to avoid this in the next trip he takes? <laughs> he's such an adventurer. Well, again, you know, don't don't eat uh, don't eat em- don't eat s- soil. With well, I'm needed. sure he didn't do that. <laughs> in them. He ate something on somebody's fingers that might have been contaminated with feces. But let's just say for the moment that he he did eat something like that. Is that uh-huh. actually the way to catch ascaris? Well, again, it's not the feces as we talked about. That's it's got to be right. in the soil That's for a right. couple of weeks. Then it's got to somehow get you know ingested in your correct, food. And, you know, and these things happen. You know, so maybe raw <laughs> vegetables. That they used soil, night soil for fertilizer, mm-hmm. and that's mm-hmm. a big yeah. way of catching this also. So agricultural practices transmit these diseases routinely. Well, <clears throat> clearly the solution is vertical farming. Hey, yeah. <laughs> that <laughs> would be one way to get rid of it. That's true. Solution is it to everything seems well, to be. not everything. Can I run my car on a vertical farm? Uh, doubt that. Unless you use biogas <laughs> from the. <laughs> Right. Or when you travel, just just drink beer and eat candy bars. Yeah. You, will be, you will not get <laughs> beer and eat candy bars. All right, we have a paper. We do. Which Dixon picked. I did. And it is from the Royal, the Proceedings of the Royal Society. That's Are right. you a member? No, I'm not a member of that that august body. That's a very high level. Is it august? It sort is. of like the National Academy of the U.S.? It's a little bit like that, actually. Yeah, yeah it's... Bottlenecks in domestic animal populations can facilitate the emergence of Trypanosoma cruzi, the etiological agent of Chagas disease. Right. And this is from the University of Pennsylvania, right. the Chaga Disease Field Laboratory in Peru, yes. the, the Institute of Ecosystem Studies in Millbrook, yeah. New York. Yeah, I know that guy very well. I, I would like to go there. I love New Millbrook. It's a very nice place. It's a fantastic facility, too. The Cary Arboretum and the Cary uh, Institute for Ecosystem Studies is an amazing place. And two other places in Peru. All right, so Dixon, you picked this. I did. What caught your eye here? <laughs> Two things. One is the town of Arequipa, which I visited <laughs> about a year ago. <laughs> okay. No, no, I visited that I town with touched. my wife. <laughs> is that where the and rocks are that are fused together? No, they did have some. That was Machu walls, Picchu, right? But we we actually went there for a um, a fantastic convent which had amazing art and an amazing uh, architecture to it. So that's that's why we visited it, yeah. without even knowing a little bit about the endemicity of Chagas disease. Uh, I didn't realize that that was one of the big centers in Peru, but it turns out to be that way. And the second thing is, of course, I picked this because there's an, there's an ecological twist to their story. And uh, I wanted to get back to a little bit more of a, of a global picture about uh, disease transmission because we've been moving in towards the refinements of the molecular aspects, and uh, I thought this would be a good foil for that. And I did recognize the author. I mean, Richard Osfeld and I have spoken many times together, and he used to participate in a course that Steve Morris and I gave called Emerging Infections, Mm -hmm. and he's a world expert on um, Lyme disease and its ecological consequences. So I think it's a good paper, but as we will see as we go through this paper, it's speculative mostly based on some interesting uh happenings okay so first of all everybody out there must realize that uh, people in peru consider guinea pigs as a delicacy (laughs) that's number one so if you've got a guinea pig for a pet 
and you invite someone from Peru to your house, hide your pet, because <laughs> otherwise they'll think you're going to serve it for dinner. You ever have one, Dixon? I almost did. I was tempted. We went to many places throughout Peru where they were being uh, featured as as cuisine. Uh, but there's a, as it turns out, there's a season for this, okay? Mm-hmm. And the season is dependent upon the weather, not whether it's summer, spring, winter, or fall, because in Peru they have very interesting uh, climate regimes, but as to whether or not the alfalfa crop was successful. Mm-hmm. And you'd say, what's that got to do with guinea pigs? That's the sole food for the guinea pigs, not S-O-U-L, S-O-L-E in this case. <laughs> yeah. So the guinea pigs are fed a very cheap food source, namely mm-hmm. alfalfa. But when there's a drought, there's no alfalfa. So now you're stuck with all these guinea pigs. Now what are you going to do? You eat them. You do, and you have a big festival. <laughs> they have these guinea pig festivals where they save two, male and female, for later on. I see. Right? And I had no idea that this was part of their heritage as well. And they, they roast up a whole bunch of guinea pigs, and they all meet at the city square, and they have a great time, and they play music, and they dance, and they celebrate the fact that they, they can do this. Uh, but at the same time, they are largely unaware of the transmissibility of a certain parasite, which is dependent upon certain activities. All right, And I'm just being vague about this to begin with because it took this group a long time to discern what the heck was going on there. Because there are very few clinical cases of Chagas disease in Arequipa. Very mm-hmm. few. Mm-hmm. So th- what they're talking about here is a very recent event because Chagas disease is a long-term chronic infection. Maybe I can yield to our clinician, uh, Daniel, to give a brief overview of the description of the clinical aspects of Chagas disease. You know, it's uh, it's always coincidence, right? You know, you've, I, I'm looking at this paper on Tuesday and I'm in, um, I'm in the clinic out at North Shore. <laughs> and uh, one of my colleagues says, you know what, I feel like we've become the Chagas disease clinic. What? And uh, I said, well, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that suddenly Chagas disease emerged. Mm-hmm. I just think now we're recognizing it. And uh, just to give some context, there are over 300,000 people living in the United States infected with Chagas. How about that? Um, now, that's the, that's the, I guess, prevalence as opposed to and it's like 300,000 people every year get infected. It's that migrants from South America, Central America mm-hmm. areas where they have Chagas have come here to the U.S., and what they've instituted is there's a concern that this disease will be transmitted in the blood supply. Right. So now people go in to donate blood, hmm. and then they get a phone call. You're, you can't donate blood. You, you tested positive for Chagas disease, oh and then they come and see us. So they test the blood supply now, or they test the donor? They, they test the donor. Okay. They test the donor before it gets introduced into the blood supply, and then the donor gets sent our way. Hmm. Occasionally, and... Um, Maybe I'll present this case at some point. I had in, I had well, there were like three patients just just that we were talking about on Tuesday. But um, I'll be darned. There was a patient from El Salvador. He went to see his doc. He had some electrical abnormalities on his EKG, and uh, the doc sent off a Chagas blood test, and it was positive. And so he came that? our way. Um, so the Chagas disease i think should we just do a quick overview of the Absolutely. Chagas disease? you bet because sure. it, it actually it's you, you you need to know that i i think to understand this paper so sure. this this trypana it's a trypanosome again i was saying it's it's a single cell but it's so complicated i always keep saying is it really just a single cell <laughs> i mean it's such a complex organism but it's a single cell the trypanosome it is transmitted by a a bug the reduvid or triatoma bug and how is it transmitted? It's transmitted by the feces of this bug. Right. What happens is this bug lands. It likes to land on the face. Why does it like to land on the face? Well, it usually lands on the face of people who are sleeping. Mm-hmm. And that's the face is exposed, right? Usually we've got covers or whatever else. Um, it lands on the face. It, it defecates. <laughs> and now somehow that feces with the infectious um, trypanosomes has to somehow get into the person. So you can either rub it into your eyeballs, and it can actually get through the conjunctiva and penetrate that way, or the bug bites you, and then you scratch, and the, the feces mm-hmm. is now on your fingers, and you're scratching it into, into the cut. This is an incredibly inefficient process. It, so it, the, the, the bug, what, what is the bug 
crapping on your face. It must want to bite you. It doesn't want to just crap. Well, on no, your it's face. the other <laughs> way. Though, actually. I, it I would... bites and then craps. Oh, so right. it, so it, it's making room for the food. Exactly right. The, okay. uh, the, the gastrocolic <laughs> reflex in a it. triatome bug. <laughs> okay. the current, that's right. The current meal displaces the okay. prior meal. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah, so it bites, it's that's eating, right. and that's then right. its stuff is coming out. That's right. and we have, what's the, same, coming we have out the same is, reflex, what, actually. What uh, phase of the... Ah, the metacyclic trypanosomes. Okay. They're highly infectious. Right. So the other thing to say, of course, is that humans are not the only host for this one. In mm. fact, in South America, I don't think there's a single mammal species that's been shown not to be infected except maybe anteaters. So everything else in South America could, and Central America too, could be a reservoir host for this infection for people. Mm -hmm. And in, in fact, these guys in this paper that we're about to review – Thought that maybe the guinea pig was. Now why do they think reservoirs. that? Was there some evidence? To well, because that? there's a connection between the number of guinea pigs oh. <laughs> per family and the <laughs> prevalence of, of Chagas positive people. Okay. So they they made a correlation here, but we'll get back. So to So let's that. finish our. Finish, yeah. We'll just quickly finish the life cycle. Hey, now, as but, we mentioned, it's incredibly inefficient. They, they estimate you have to probably be bitten about seventeen hundred exactly. times. Amazing. So, so you know what? This this disease doesn't obviously exist because it's mathematically, right. statistically it right. impossible. It just can't so be right. so yeah. in one night, would a bug bite you seventeen hundred times? <laughs> no. Okay. That no. takes many, many nights. Many, right? many, many times. Yeah. So you don't see this a lot in travelers, right? You got to be in the area, just the infection. I'd put a, I'd put a veil on my face, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when Darwin first traveled down the coast of South America, he actually yeah. climbed up over the Andes to see the uh, the jungle part, and he had to sleep that night mm. in a uh, a camp. And he woke up the next morning covered with reduvid bugs, mm -hmm. covered with reduvid bugs. So one of the rumors was that eventually Darwin developed Chagas disease, and that's what did him. And that's not the case. But yeah. they're, they're big. They're big bugs. They're huge. They're huge bugs. They're, they're like, about the size of a yeah a, a water bug, which we would call an adult cockroach of the yeah. Peripheral Americana. They're huge. Yeah. They're like and they're half the size of your thumb. And they're thumb. true bugs, and that they don't you don't even know they're on your face, and you can't feel them bite because they inject an anesthetic which kills the pain of the bite. And then they suck up like half of their body volume in blood and then they lumber off to digest this underneath a picture frame or into the thatched roof or that sort of thing. Okay. So the paradox so, here is that it, there's a lot of human infections, yet the transmission is so transmission inefficient. It's, it's inefficient. very inefficient. Four, yeah. They say some humans 40% uh, positive in some exactly communities. Exactly. Right. How can this happen? That's an enormous number. <laughs> and the bugs, when they look at the bugs for their percentage mm -hmm. infection, almost all of them are infected. Yeah. So yeah. where the hell are they picking this infection up from? Well, I think they're going to bring up here that my simplified story is not 100%. What we've started to realize uh. is that you can you can get Chagas disease through ingestion of you contaminated, yes, we'll say can. things, because we're going to hopefully get at what what things are contaminated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so so somehow it gets so we, we've said somehow it gets e either through your eyeball or through this cut, and you've been scratching, or we've right. mentioned somehow you might be able to ingest and get these through ingestion, right. and then it's going to undergo um, in most people a transition to a chronic disease and there's different forms and and in the future when we discuss a case we'll go into detail but what will often happen is these people we're seeing here in the u.s can go for years and years decades that's right and mm -hmm. then start mm -hmm. to develop problems in yeah, yeah, yeah. in the heart that's right. That's right. or the intestines yeah. and so there's this whole issue about do you treat people what percent of people will end up it suggests about 20% will eventually end up with some manifestation. So it's not mm -hmm. benign. It's right. actually, you know, right. but then you say, oh, 80% will be just fine. Well, <laughs> if we can only tell who those were and who those were, because it's not sure. easy to treat and the medicines are, oh, right. are pretty toxic. But so, hey, that's probably enough of a sort of a clinical yeah. background for us to exactly. To hit so into when, this. You, when you rub it into your eye as a small child, it actually develops a cellulitis at that site. And so if you go online and type out Romagna's sign, which was named after a clinician that discovered this particular feature mm -hmm. of the early infection, you'll see that these little kids have a swollen eye. The other eye is perfectly normal, and the well, the left or the right eye, wherever they rub the feces in with the metacyclic trips, that's where the infection began, and it creates this cellulitis. And the other thing to, to mention is that if, as opposed to the African trypanosomes, which are strictly blood parasites, trypanosoma cruzi, which is a little bit related to that trypanosome, 
probably during the Jurassic period, uh, when the continents separated, that's when this thing became two species, maybe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, right. <clears throat> this parasite is a strict tissue parasite for most of its life cycle. So it's in the tissues, it's in the cells, and it's indiscriminate in terms of which cells it infects. It can affect a wide variety of cells. But once it gets into nervous cell tissue, like the myenteric plexus of the small intestine or the bundles of his inside the heart, then it starts to exhibit its um, effects on symptoms, and the patient develops an enlarged heart or an enlarged megacolon and things. It really gets at hand, but it, it takes a long time for that process, right? The transfusion trypanosome infections are different, I think, because we've had some acute infections described here in this paper where people have actually died within months after they acquired the infection so that the, the root of infection might be very important in terms of determining what happens. Uh, so that's something new that's actually come out of these studies, I think, in, in that uh, this new sim, this new um, way of transmitting this infection through uh, the juices of bugs <laughs> crushed up with, let's say, sugar cane to make a, a drink yeah. that people on the beaches yeah. of Brazil would be drinking. You can catch Chagas disease by having a good time at the beach. That's really, and not being bitten by the bug or not being deposited on with the feces. None of that happened. You drank this sugary coated stuff, and the next thing you know, you're 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 mortally wounded by and this fruit person. juice. There's been and fruit, fruit juices, juice epidemic. Right. So yeah, I guess, and it should be important just to point out. Not only do we see the the burden and the chronic, but there's an acute form. Right. Can right. Be so, do you have an estimate in this country of these three hundred thousand people? How many infections have been acquired through the inadvertent giving of blood donated by these people. And I think the CDC has a real number on this, which is why they're on red alert now for testing. Yeah, I mean, I would say, I would say current, you know, the current blood supply is safe from Chagas disease. It's okay. all, all okay. the donors are tested. And that's been going on for a number of years. So, But prior you know, to that, I is, think we had some is. like like eight or 900 cases, which were shown to be acquired through the uh, giving of blood. I think Vincent will Google that, but I, fortunately yeah. I think it was less than that. But, oh, um, okay. Fortunately. Now, the name Victor Nusenzweig might mean something to some of our listeners. He's the husband of Ruth Nusenzweig, who was at NYU and one of your teachers. I hearken back to this because they were from Brazil, by the way. Yes. And Victor Nusenzweig had a perfect way of intercepting this parasite in the blood supply. He recommended using a 1 to 4,000 dilution of gentian violet in the blood. Mm -hmm. And 1 to 4,000, mm -hmm. the blood turns blue at that point. And it kills the parasites without harming the host. So you could probably recommend doing that here. And he tried like... <laughs> crazy to get that instituted here when they first moved from Brazil to the United States and nobody would listen to him because they didn't think it was a very serious issue here. But apparently uh, we could reconsider that as, a, as an approach to controlling the blood supply if, if this early testing method fails to detect, let's say, the early cases, right? Yeah. Those people could go on. They don't yeah. know they have it. They yeah. give blood and the next thing you know, the blood supply is contaminated. So there's some real reasons for wanting to study all of the uh, nuance with regards to this infection. And I think that's another reason why I picked this paper, because I thought it was so intriguing. Yeah. Well, now that we've, now that everyone is, is convinced <laughs> that Chagas disease really matters and is important right. not only worldwide, right. but right. also here in uh, the United States, right. um, should, we, should we hit the paper? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Well, so they, they put up a number of hypotheses, right, Dixon? About yeah, they had four altogether, as I recall. And they went through each of them, and they did a little did. Lab, lab work, but a lot of modeling, statistical a modeling. A lot of right? modeling and a lot of old um, statistical approaches to actually malaria outbreaks. So McDonald-Ross uh, equations mm -hmm. were originally instituted during the turn of the century to, to study the uh, spread of malaria in various communities. But it seems to work well here as well. So, so they had some background on what that is? Yeah, the, would you? Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Good, so, because I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <Okay>. so happy. <laughs> so just to give some context, the, the two people that they – so we, they're going to go through, as we mentioned, four hypotheses, and they're going to be using these um, – epidemiological um, modeling um, right. equations. Right. And Ronald Ross is always credited, you know, discovered that malaria could be transmitted by mosquitoes. But he himself 
was um, he was actually a successful scientist and did a lot and yeah. and he had an aspiration to create a whole new field which was the idea idea of or the field of mathematical modeling of epidemics so he and the george mcdonald was a person who worked with him actually there were several people in the field but there's this hmm. ross mcdonald model which has been modified over and over and the variable standardized um, wanted to say, well, what are the things, the different factors that play a part in predicting what an epidemic will do? Right. And so they would create um, a variable and then assign it. And so they'd say, okay, well, the, the population density of humans might affect an epidemic. So we'll call mm -hmm. that H, mm -hmm. and that's going to figure in the equation. The population density of mosquitoes, the vector, in this case, it'll be the Reduvid bug. So that will, well, when it was mosquitoes, it was an M. So for the Reduvid <laughs> bug, probably still use an M to keep it from. Uh -huh. um, and then they had, you know, what's the rate at which the mosquitoes might be feeding, the vector might be feeding on humans. Um, you might also want to factor in what percent of the mosquitoes are infected. And in the mosquitoes, because it was malaria-based initially, what percent of the mm. infected mosquitoes can transmit are infectious. And so they tried to put all these different factors in to calculate what was going to happen in the epidemic. So you could also figure out how might you intervene? Right. Do you want to spread the people out farther? Do you want to kill the mosquitoes? Do you, do you want to, you know, keep the infected humans from passing it on to the next vector? Yeah. Um, and and what we're going to see in this paper is they're going to they're going to apply this complicated equation, there's a bunch of math in there, and they're going to test each one of these hypotheses to say what factor is really key in the Chaga spread. Okay, let's go through the different hypotheses. The first right. one is that that this, the Cruzi is transmitted via coprophagy among insects. Exactly. They actually did an experiment to test they that. They did that. <laughs> that. That didn't bear uh, fruit. As they, it were. They, so <laughs> copro is excrement. So this is the eating of excrement, the coprophagy. Yeah. And the nymphs, this, this insect undergoes an incomplete metamorphosis, meaning that when the adult reduvid bugs mate, and the female worm, uh, the, the female worm, the female bug starts to lay eggs. When the eggs hatch, they look a little bit like the adult. All right, they're they're like little cockroaches that also have the incomplete metamorphosis, mm. and it just keeps getting bigger every time it molts. It grows and it gets bigger and bigger. So, what does it feed on? What do the nymphs feed on? And the answer is they feed on the same thing as the adults. Yeah. They feed on blood. Yeah, okay, they let they let the nymphs develop with adults that were infected, and it didn't didn't matter. The, they're not born with it, yep. so it's not transovarial infection. Number one and number two, the adult infected adults do not give it to their offspring. Okay. Yes, and they are they have to eat the tritone bug has to eat feces. If it doesn't, it will die because it won't acquire the the bacteria, the symbiont bacteria. It yeah. needs yeah, to yeah, digest no, blood. That's, that's right. right. So that's we right. know they have to eat their the feces. Their microbiome isn't there, but they're not getting the shagas the through eating feces. So that they they get rid of hypothesis one. You're not getting it from eating right. old feces. Guess what? That's the wrong stage of the infection for the bug because that's not what they ingest and get infected yeah. to begin with. They get the stage that circulates in your blood as a mammal. So it's probable you could have guessed that the bug feces wasn't the stage. There's another aspect of this that needs to be mentioned because the word is wonderful. <laughs> Kleptohemo. <laughs> that's right. I love this one too. That's Say it again, please. Kleptohemodipnonism. That's great. It's the that is great. So basically a nymph pierces the exoskeleton of another nymph and feeds on its hemolymph. Or, or of an adult that is just fed on an adult guinea pig, let's say, or something like that. Yeah, they define it as a nymph on a nymph. Okay. Yes, this was coined in 1951, cannibalism among the triatoma right. bugs. Leptohemodipnonism. So here's a... a, a <laughs> say it quickly. Coined, coined and not used a lot. <laughs> But it's still a, it could just you, rolls off the tongue. Can that be the title of this episode? I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> no one will pronounce it. That's okay. But so why does that have some biological um, bogusness associated? I don't know. With that? That's you would be the one to answer that. <laughs> yeah. Well, where are the trypanosomes? You have to ask that question. In in all of these cases, where does the trypanosome live, and what is the life cycle in the tritomid bug? No one has ever said anything about that here, mm. but they should because it's a strictly gut tract limited infection. And I knew someone, his name was Mercio Pereira. You may have run across I him see. 
in the early days of his stay right here, working with Elvin Cabot. And what was he working on? He was working on lectin binding, mm -hmm. sugars that bound proteins. And he, he did an analysis of the gut tract of triatomid bugs because he was from Brazil. Mm. And he could tell you which lectin sugar would bind to the protein along the gut tract of the triatomid bug. And so the hypothesis was that as the trypanosomes mature and develop different sugars on their surfaces, they move down the gut tract of the triatomid bug until they get to the anus. Mm -hmm. In this case, you'd call it the anus, not the uh, rectum. Sure, you could do that. And by the time they get down to the, <laughs> by the, time they get down to the bottom, there is, there's nowhere to go except out. Because they, the lectins that they bound to, they have developmentally evolved away from. Right. So the next thing you know, they're, they're now infectious for humans. But that wouldn't be the case for a reduvid bug. So you're saying there's no, there, there's no life form in the hemolymph. Correct. If you knew the life This is exactly it. right. So this doesn't make any This kleptohemodipnonism doesn't Well, matter. it was worth a shot, but, you know, it was worth a I shot. But, but, but the other thing was that if you had a fully engorged female. Yeah. You could have pierced through into the gut tract, yeah, I suppose, and then right. you could acquire it. But that didn't even didn't happen. Didn't happen. Okay, it didn't happen. So two out of two. Sorry. All right. Hypothesis two: a reservoir other than guinea pigs is driving transmission. Right. And we should say that they actually looked at yeah. all the infected reduvids that they got from this little area were from guinea pig colonies. Right? Exactly right. Which exactly are being raised right. for people to eat. Right. That's correct. So that is correct. Are there other species? Right. So, right. how did they address that? Right. I guess they went out and tried to. Well, you can you can collect. bleed dogs and cats and see, various other the... mammals in the area. Yeah, they actually looked at. So they said maybe these insects um, are feeding on, and they looked and they said, you know what, the, the infected vectors are all eating guinea pigs. They're all right. biting guinea pigs. So. Why? Because it's so prevalent. Yeah, I think it was thirty-four out of thirty-six identified <laughs> blood meals. Sure. It was guinea pigs. You, it's. You know, yeah. okay. the bugs love to eat guinea pigs. They love they, to bite they, guinea pigs. Given a choice. <laughs> yes. So, hypothesis three, persistently infected hosts drive the parasite through vector populations. So I think in this part of this work, they discovered that there's some guinea pigs who harbor infection for a long time. But very few, though. Very few, right? Which so is also interesting, right? What, um, let's see if I can find those data. So... While you're thinking, right? I'll just add some. Yeah, this this I here. thought was a challenge, and I'll, I'll let you, and then I'll let you. I, right. I hate to interrupt. <laughs> no, no, this is not an interruption. Is that this a, this one is a little bit of a challenge because it is. they they talk about some of these animals harboring infection for three four hundred days, yeah. but in the um, guinea pigs the don't guinea, live that yeah, long. the guinea pigs they only keep them alive. They you like to eat your guinea pigs at about three months. That's, That's apparently right. when they That's are right. at their tastiest. Exactly. So you're only Pumpus. talking about a lifespan of about 90 days in yes. most situations but then again we talked about alfalfa run short you've got two you're hanging out you're waiting for the next crop of alfalfa to get cheap again yep. so the bottleneck phenomena may actually play so this this figures into the whole sure. ecological context sure. now we did a lot of walking while we were in Arequipa, and my wife and i uh, took a lot of pictures and i bet if i go back and review them i probably couldn't even find a picture of a dog in any of them now, how about a guinea pig Oh, we saw bundles of them everywhere. Really? We saw them on the backs of, you know, like how these pictures of chickens in Southeast Asia being delivered to market? That's what we saw for guinea pigs. Dead? No, they were all alive. They were being delivered alive. You can imagine all the whistling going on inside. They <laughs> where are we going? I don't know. Where are we going? How big are these guinea pigs? <laughs> oh, they're a good size. They're, you know, the size of an average pet guinea okay. pig, basically. Okay. Wow. So, dogs. <laughs> exactly right. Now, see, we see how much you learn when you study parasites because yeah, this has nothing to do with parasites per se. It has something to do with human behavior. So I love the interdigitation of data from the biological to the sociological. That's that's. I love that part, right? I, I really like this part a lot. So, so the reservoir hosts to maintain trypanosoma cruzi, let's say in rural areas where guinea pigs are not considered to be a delicacy, let's say in the jungles, where you have a lot of latex uh, being collected by people who work there, or farmers or miners, the, their, their dogs would be the reservoirs, okay? And they look mangy. They really look horrible because they're suffering from Chagas disease as well. And they're constantly being fed upon by the reduvid bugs from these 
poorly constructed houses with thatched roofs. And, and in fact, there's a program to eliminate thatched roofs. And in one case, in the Cone area of South America, which is a combination of Patagonia and Chile, mm -hmm. they have eliminated the thatched roof. And when you eliminate the thatched roof and you get rid of some of the pictures on the walls, the habitats for the triatomid tri bugs disappear. So without drugs, without uh, vaccines, you can control the infection this way. All right. So, but these people in Arequipa, uh, I would guess that dogs would would rise in terms of significance in terms of a reservoir host. Okay. Yeah, they do. They do talk about that. That it's really um, this whole guinea pig phenomenon may be just in particular areas in the Indies, right. outside the Indies. Right. Right. But they do, as we so we hypothesis three. They said might be minor, right. but you know not the big one. And then we get to hypothesis four, yeah, which is the four big is the one. Best, the more, that's right. And there they're going to do a lot of these um, modeling simul right. these that's simulations right. That's right. where, and this is the bottleneck as we talked about where the price of um, the food gets too expensive right. and you're going to keep just a couple guinea pigs per per i don't know animal management group will we call it per <laughs> per rancher yeah guinea pig rancher yeah yeah and then they're going to look at the duration of the bottleneck and right. the incidents the, the the impact this has and that's really where they see that um the biggest um impact is these bottlenecks right. that are created so they do a, they do it electronically they model yeah. it they they go from 10 guinea pigs to two right and they keep the vectors at a thousand in their model, and they said this has a huge effect. It must because well, in what their if model, you're in a duvid bug and you're hungry yeah. and you want a good meal, and what, what, what happened to the guinea pigs? <laughs> Where two. the hell did they so, go? So they're all going to bite the same yeah, two. They're all going to go to right? people. They're really, they're going to bite people from that point on, and that's how you get transmitted. So reducing the guinea pigs to two push the in vector yeah. infection to over 85%, yeah. right. which is what you mentioned earlier. Most of the reduvids are infected. And this is why, at least in this guinea pig model. Exactly. So, But are they catching it from gonna, the guinea pigs or are gonna, they catching it from the dogs? If you're going to wipe out a population, you better wipe them all out. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The, well, the best way is to control the reduvids. Well, they don't want to do this because they want to eat I them. Know, As you I said, know. they want to keep a breeding pair, That's right? right? That's right. That's right. That's Maybe right. they have to keep them in in mesh cages. That well, I don't. Yeah, the reduvid bugs are huge, it's so not, it, it would not take much of a screen to keep them out. But yeah. only only yeah. two percent of the guinea pigs were infected, right? So the last two could that actually be the reason why the reduvid bugs are still gaining an infection? Well, that's their idea, or right? is there a but dog again, in this picture? Somewhere? That's the model. The model says I that know, it make a big difference, but we don't know experimentally. So I raise this as a question. I would say, yeah, I agree, Rich. Uh, did you look for the dogs, and you know what did you find there? And and what about latent infections in people? Well, uh, can people, you can people transmit it through a reduvid? Of course, of course, that's how it's transmitted in yeah. many places. So One they say gets here, bit. It, we don't have any admits into the hospital they system of Arequipa meals? because it's such a recent thing. Do they take blood meals the reduvids? Of course. So they're picking up new, exactly what metacyclic, yeah, forms. Hmm. Triple mastigotes, they're called triple mastigotes, in the bloodstream. So the, when the organism transforms from the intracellular amastigote stage, right, yeah. to go back into the blood to be available to be picked up by the reduvid, that that's happens in people as well as dogs. The same life cycle occurs in both all the mammals. So if the guinea pigs are down to two and there are a thousand reduvids, what about the family that lives with the guinea pigs? Maybe they're infected too. Could be, yeah. And if they yeah. are, then those are responsible for maintaining the infection. Right. But if if the if the reduvids are also biting the guinea pigs, then that would put them that would infect them and then well, that's, all the other bugs. I want to raise that as a them. point here. Yeah. In the colonies of guinea pigs, only two percent were infected. Why is that? Because it's know. not transmitted by biting. So if you look at a dog, for instance, and we have wait, you said it's not transmitted wait, by biting. That's correct. So it's transmitted by the feces contaminating the environment. Remember, right, we've got a remember, rub it's a subtle it's difference to a person or to a guinea pig. I understand, but when a a reduvid bites and takes a blood meal, it's picking up parasites, it right? Is, but and it will transmit them by pooping on someone else. Correct. Yeah, okay. that's correct. So yeah. imagine yourself as a dog, for instance, and you're sitting there minding your own business, and some large insect lands on you you don't even suspect it and you're looking around and you you start to scratch and you're just and then you notice this bug this bug is filling up with blood what's your first instinct Stop. as a dog no you <laughs> thank you but you don't have hands i'm, a, I'm thinking of a human to bite your you tail. know what they do they, they, bite they, your tail, they actually right? eat the bug <laughs> 
They eat the bug. Yeah, I'm not surprised. So there's a there's a trypanosome transmission cycle in the United States, which is transmitted by a different kind of reduvid bug, which doesn't defecate. Mm-hmm. Right away. It defecates somewhere else. And it feeds mostly on wild animals. And they catch it by eating the bugs. Okay. So imagine yourself now as a guinea pig colony. Do guinea pigs eat reduvid bugs? I don't know. They Apparently don't. not because 80, 90% of those yeah, guinea pigs are not infected. And they certainly don't catch it by licking the feces off of wherever the bite occurred. They're not even aware it occurred. So I think the feces just dries out, the organisms die, and that's the end. So that's does, what happens so in a guinea, guinea pig guinea, colony. How does the guinea pig get infected? Good question. Yeah, they're not going to scratch the Good bite, right? Question. Maybe they groom each other, and maybe occasionally when they groom mm. each other, they lick in the fecal event of a recent bite from a reduvid. Maybe that's how it occurs. Okay. But otherwise, it's a mystery as to how all these reduvid bugs get to up to 85% infected from 2% infected guinea pigs. I'm going to jump in. There's a there's a pregnant pause there for me to jump in. <laughs> there I is. Got the no, I'm done. I'm, right? done. Good question. No, I'm the, done. I'm done. I realized when, Vince, when you started to ask these questions that, that I had not quite finished the life cycle, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, how does it get back into the reduvid bug? Right, right. And, and that raises this very interesting thing called xenodiagnosis. I don't mm-hmm. know if you're familiar with that. And this, you know, n- now we've got our fancy blood test, right? Where we actually, oh, I tested your blood. You've You've been exposed. In the acute um, stage of Chagas, when you have these um, forms that are infective to the triatome circulating, what they used to do, and they still do in parts of the world, is you take a, an uninfected reduvid bug and you let it feed on an infected person. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then so much you know, later, you check the reduvid bug right. and you dissect it and you can see the trypanosomes. Mm-hmm. So it's a xenodiagnosis. Yeah. You let the triatome bug feed on someone who you think might be infected. Yeah. And then hmm. you test, and so that, then that's the way the normal life cycle is working. Somehow these reduvid bugs can get the infected forms out of the blood. Right. But okay. They, they they ingest such a large volume. I mean, it's measured in milliliters, so it's it's an enormous volume. Basically, it's not like a mosquito. Yeah. So you know, this is a, this is a fascinating study that's still ongoing because I also looked up a related article um, to the kind of epidemiologic analysis that they're trying to apply from a site of infection and then outwards from that site to say how many other things could possibly be involved in this uh, epidemic. And uh, they have some unusual statistical methods that they apply for this. And the the way where this is being done is at the University of Pennsylvania, mostly. Um, but, uh, you know, the, these are are unanswerable questions from the standpoint of theoretical evaluations. You actually have to go and do the field work in order to find out all the nuance here. So I think they're missing a few pieces of the puzzle that when they do find them, they'll be able to develop a more robust mathematical model for that area of the world because it's going to have to be specifically tailored for Arequipa sure. or for other places like Arequipa. I think the general idea, though, that the uh, compression of a host... And its yeah. relationship to amplifying yeah. is very interesting. It can apply to many, many host vector situations, right? So true. I like that, yep. although the details may not be – and they actually say the guinea pig relevance may not yeah, be 100%, yeah. as, right. as you say. But I think that concept that that a bottleneck mm-hmm. can really perpetuate a parasite. And weather-driven cool. knocks out the alfalfa yes. production. Weather, the guinea pig population exactly. drops and the human population gets infected. So, D- Dixon, what? do you know any other – Infections where the weather has had an effect. Uh, <laughs> me, mm, I was about to mention West Nile, and uh, in fact, I will mention it because I just ran across an interesting paper published from the CDC in which it's now been definitively shown mm-hmm. that West Nile transmission from mosquitoes to humans is weather driven and it's high temperatures and it's droughty conditions. We should do that paper on TWIV, Dixon. I would love to do that paper. You should find it, send it to me. I will do it. Um, but there's the other one I was thinking of is hantavirus pulmonary uh, syndrome, okay. right? Okay, okay, that's Where another one. Where if sure. you have abundant rainfall, this was the original outbreak in the Four Corners area, yeah. abundant rainfall, high yeah. crop of pinon nuts, That's right. which the mice eat. You yeah. get more mice, they yeah. get into your house. Right. Well, the pinola nut virus. production has to fail the next year. 
but you've still got a lot of mice. So they go looking for food in people's houses where they would never. And they nest before. in the house and they defecate. That's, and yeah, that's, um, right. that's right. So there's a correlation between rainfall and then that sure. outbreak. And I have to admit, others. Hanta was what came to mind for me yeah. when you brought up. That's the classic. Yeah, yeah. it's a yeah, yeah, good yeah. one. Well, you know what? Malaria is driven like this, and so is um, uh, loss of fever. And That's so why we talk about the weather on TWIV. We do. Because That's it a, drives a hint, infection. <laughs> and yes, people the, are, the rains have started. The mosquito lifespan is extended. Uh, well, <laughs> actually, if you live in India, the rains have started right now. <laughs> All right. Are we done with this paper? I think so. Because uh, uh, Daniel has a hard out here. This is hard, hard work. This is not easy stuff. No, that was a great paper. It's a but, big team. But I have a, uh, I have another case. Is right. everybody ready? Yeah, for we're ready. I'm going to take ready. notes. It's like getting ready to attack the sale. But Vincent, are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dixon, are you ready? Oh, yeah. Okay. Clinical case being presented. A 20-year-old Japanese female student <coughs> comes to the ER with severe abdominal pain. She is nauseated and has vomited. She feels slightly warm, as though her and, and as though her belly is larger than normal. Um, she does let us know that she had just gotten together with, with a few of her friends to enjoy. Um, I, I'm going to give a little bit of a hint here. I will call it to enjoy some homemade sushi. Our patient was the one who prepared the sushi. She made homemade sushi rice. Handcrafted. With the vinegar and sugar, the way you do that. And then she prepared salmon and tuna rolls. Is it salmon or salmon? Salmon. Um, Salmon. The salmon had been brought back to Colorado and was caught by her boyfriend. And the tuna she had purchased at the store and was sushi grade. Hey, talk into the mic. <laughs> That's a lot of money. Is the sushi grade a lot of money? <laughs> Lots of money. So her boyfriend okay. caught the salmon in Colorado. No, 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 he did not catch the salmon in Colorado. We didn't ask for where that's from. Yeah, we haven't we haven't Will. gotten where it's from yet. I'm going to give you just a little. We're going to give you the the. So she's a young, healthy um, mm-hmm. person with no past medical history, no surgeries. She hasn't had any allergies. Um, she does have a mother. Um, she says my mom has anemia. Um, that may or may not be relevant. She takes um, OCP, over-the-counter contraceptive pills. No, oral contraceptive pills. <laughs> um, she's a, she, oriental. Contraceptive she reports that she's yes, that's oriental <laughs> contraceptive. No, she's she's a student at Colorado State University. At Colorado. State so that gives us context. Okay. This is occurring in Fort Collins, okay. where this occurred in Fort oh, Collins. Okay. Um, she lives with a bunch of friends um, right. off campus housing Um, she does not report any toxic habits she's only 20 right so she's below the the drinking age Um, she hasn't traveled anywhere Um, I guess she has sex right because she's on oral contraceptives I under exposure history I'm going to say all the usual ones so yes she is sexually active and with just her boyfriend or with multiple partners Uh, she has just the monogamous um, so she says so she says this is something I've added to my repertoire. I since noticed it's a, it's a first question out of your mouth almost. <laughs> so you say, Dixon. <laughs> so says me. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. So since she's that's taking it. oral contraception, so we shouldn't. She's not using condoms. That's clear. Shouldn't ask too many more questions. Well, I will give. I'm going to give her. Um, I'll give just a little more information. Then maybe um, maybe there could be some questions people may want to ask. Um, she. Um, Temperature is 100.2. Blood mm-hmm. pressure 140 over 90. Heart rate is in the high 90s. Um, she's breathing in the mid to it's upper teens. <laughs> um, and she's she's normal. I mean, she looks you know head to toe exam is right. is relatively unremarkable except for she appears distressed. She appears to be in pain. Um, her belly is distended. And uh, she is tender in the left upper quadrant. Now, what does that mean? That means when we, if you look at the belly, so the person's laying down, think of it this way, they are left and on the upper, so below the rib cage on the left, when you push, it is tender. Right. And what's under there, D- Daniel? People, people have to figure that out. And, and I always thought that was really, I always thought that was really interesting, you know. And like every sort of conversation, but what is right here? And, you know, it's probably worth people just, you know, 
spend right. a little time, Google online, figure out where your organs are. You bet. You know, it's well, nice to know where your organs are. My brain is there. It's, your brain is in your <laughs> upper left. <laughs> so can I ask an epidemiological question? Sure. Uh, did anybody else show up in the ER from that particular gathering? No. And, and I can um, tell you and, why and they did. Didn't. Well, nobody, nobody else, <laughs> no one wanted to admit nobody they were there. else showed up sick. But her friends, her, her girlfriends, ah, okay. did come with her. Right. Um, they also... They ate you know, the they sushi. Ate, they, yeah, did they eat the same they stuff? They ate it, yep. Did they favor one over the other? Nah. <laughs> You're giving it away, Dixon. No, I'm not. No, 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 did no. They, I just wanted did to they know if there's something different about their eating habits, that's all. No, and actually, that's a good epidemiology thing that we'll, we'll ask people. If they're, oh, we were all together at this this picnic, let's say. Right. And uh, you know, and you try to figure out well who ate what. Mm-hmm. You know, so, that was like the cookie dough thing. You know, you find out <laughs> what, did, what did everybody eat that sandwiches. was in common. Now in this situation, you just had one person who was sick. So you may want to see is there something you ate that no one else. Yeah. You know, and let's say That's she right. said, you know, I ate the salmon, nobody else wanted it. Then you might start thinking salmon yeah, yeah, versus yeah, yeah. tuna. Yeah. In this case, no, they all they all ate both. They all ate both. It was all. By the way, that's why they feed pilots and co-pilots different food on airlines. They still do that? In case something is different about the food and one of them doesn't get sick, at least uh, the airline. Do they still do that? I think they do. I think they do. Uh, Was there any food with mayonnaise? (laughs) You know, that's... um, If you notice that, right, a lot of the sushi in the U.S., they're now like they drizzle like this mayonnaise on the surface. Spicy spicy Um, tuna hen rolls, etc. Yeah, a lot of the spicy has it. So. So that's a good question, and no, there was no there was no mayonnaise. Right. I was thinking the other day that sushi has become this. I mean, it's an art. I mean, they put all this stuff in that never used to be in sushi You're to right. appeal to a broader this clientele. Is mm-hmm. This is true, right? Yep. But you got you know they have always a little cooked fishes. Sometimes it used to be a piece of fish, some right. rice, right. and a, and the wrapped seaweed. And yeah, that little, was your sushi. But now they're huge. Wasabi big, on the bottom. Very complicated, beautiful looking things oh, with yeah. all sorts of yeah. things on the outside and sauces. It's I don't know if that's still and sushi. avocado is now being avocado. introduced, which apparently is now being introduced to Japan to see if maybe. <laughs> <laughs> they might want to do that, which wasn't historically part of it. Right. Often you eat sushi for lunch, Dixon. I do. I like sushi. I like sushi? I, I, yeah. I like it. I like the vegan varieties, and I also like the uh, fish. Aside, f- aside from the fish, which you focused on, was there what else did they consume? Yeah, I, I, I want to bring that up, too, because I think that's important in the, in the history, is people come in and they say, I just had dinner, mm. you know, at this, you know, at this diner, and we all ate there together, and we're all, you know, and, and often it's, you know, where did you eat lunch? Where did you eat breakfast? Where did you eat dinner the night before? Um, depending upon what you might be concerned about, there's different incubation periods. Sure, sure. So a lot of time, it's forget the restaurant. It's not. It's not what you just had an hour ago. It's yeah. what did you have? You know these other times. And so we do, and we do that. We ask them. So you know, in this case, it's one person who's sick, so it's harder to pin down right. at this point. You know, had, was it what she had for lunch? Was it, you know, was she camping the weekend before? Was she drinking unpurified water? How long after the uh, meal did she come into the ER? That would right? be my question, too. Um, it was not that long. You we're said talking, she had just enjoyed homemade She had sushi. just enjoyed. So a we're few talking, hours? Yeah, we're talking an hour or two. We're okay. talking a very short period of time. <laughs> Dixon liked that time I, course. Well, I like Vincent's question. Okay. No, but I think that's important, too. Very it wasn't, though, oh, here it is at 3 in the morning, and That's we right. had our sushi dinner at 4. What did you have the night before? Um, <laughs> yeah. No, we asked that, and it was, it was unremarkable. You know what's tough to do, by the way, just as an aside, is to sit down and recount exactly what yeah, you had to eat right. for a week prior to this time. And it, uh, invariably, you'll get it all wrong. Mm-hmm. So an epidemiologist really has their work cut out for That's them why, to find out. That's why... All three meals of mine every day are the same. This <laughs> exactly the same. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I do often people that have like nausea, vomiting. Yeah. I think there might be a dietary precipitant. I will have them um, keep a food diary. And I'll say every time just write. And people That's say, oh, I don't important. need to do that. I can tell you. Yeah, and no, I, you can't. And uh, yeah, I really think it makes a difference. Have them write it down. And also yeah. for me, I can then glance through and you know, show me when you vomited. Show me when you had these That's symptoms. Right. And I can right. start saying, you know, you always eat an apple. You know, before uh, right, you know, right. sometimes it's you know, it, but it's hard sure. to see that pattern until you really get people to write down. Right. All right, that does it. That does it. 
and I think we should wrap this episode since both of you need to leave. I'm afraid. At some point in the future, we will need to do an email and (laughs) case episode again because we're they're accumulating. Yep. Nevertheless, TWIP number 92, you can find it at iTunes at microworld.org slash TWIP. Also using your uh, app for your smartphone, Android, iOS. There are plenty of podcatchers. You can get it there as well. And if you have questions or comments, send them to TWIP at TWIV.TV. Or, of course, if you want to take a crack at the case report, send them there as well. TWIP at TWIV.TV. Daniel Griffin is here at Columbia University Medical Center. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, it's a pleasure. Dixon de Pommier is at trichinella.org. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. And medicalecology.com. Yes. I hope you enjoy the Whitney. Oh, I do, too. It's going to be a thrill just to see the building up close. Brand new. Brand new. Yeah. So along the High Line, so it should be a spectacular experience. Used to be a member when it was at the old place. yeah. I remember seeing an exhibit where they had a cow hanging in a tank of formaldehyde. <laughs> yeah, I saw that there, too. Long time ago. They had a shark in section, a cross I section. Get, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I don't get it. It's quite interesting. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I wonder if that cow had mad cow disease. <laughs> it doesn't anymore. <laughs> Music you hear on TWIP is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkies. You can hear his work at ronaldjenkies.com. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP is is parasitic. parasitic.